Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And we are part two of Ed's Quarter Box. Yeah. We're only on the G's, man, so we got to breeze through <laughs> these bitches. I don't, I don't know this book. Yeah, I grabbed it just because it's like, it is that like middle stage where it's not quite Marvel, not quite DC kind of work, but yeah. it's, it's better than like the roughest shit you could get, man. Once again, more weird elf things. That's a hell of a image. Probably inspired by like a Steranko. Yeah. Not too bad. More Gambit and Associates. <laughs> yeah. So weird looking, man. Yeah, I, I have this comic as well, and I picked it up for that weird looking quality. Not a lot of comics look like this in 87. Uh, so part of that black and white boom, but also kind of a distinct style. You know, this is not something you would see at Marvel, although it reminds me at times of Keith Giffen, some of the layouts there. I agree, and maybe a piece of, like, Robotech influence. Yeah, definitely there's there's some element of, like, cartoons, anime. Sometimes you gotta got to stack that box, man, to make <laughs> it work. And I'm actually, uh, this fellow right here, Gary Sassman, he uh, is from Pittsburgh. He worked for the local news here in town, and uh, did a comic called Innocent Bystander. Um, self-publish it for a little while when that was a viable thing in the post-Bone world. But then he hooked up with uh, Kozlowski and, and Image Comics and, and would continue to do his comic stuff now. But uh, these days he works for the San Diego Comic-Con. These are pretty interesting as, like, image history. You know, it's such an... Super early. Not what I would think of when I think of Image Comics. Yeah, probably before uh, Walking Dead. This one caught my eye. G.I. Cat. This is out of Wichita, 1990. Don't see a lot of comics out of Wichita. They have a convention there that I've been to a couple of times. Um, I'm not sure how far Kevin Nolan is from there. I know he's in Kansas somewhere, but pretty bizarre. This comic. Has hockey, hypodermic needles. Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so Fun cover. Glamour Puss, 19 and 22. This is Dave Sims, I guess, follow-up to Cerebus. And uh, this is a series that I've been collecting lately. And mostly because there's a backup story. This is a really bizarre comic. Almost impossible to explain. If I had to get a minute to mention it. But there's a lot of uh, exploration of guys like Stan Drake and Alex Raymond, their techniques, and then specifically the death of Alex Raymond is what a lot of this is about. And uh, just odd odd comics he's recreating a lot of these classic strips and then talking about the tools he uses i don't know any other comics like that one caliber's god's hammer that right there is what sold me jim califior yeah he he did his some work on uh aquaman when aquaman had his hand cut off and had the harpoon hand yeah did he do Valiant stuff as well? I'm not sure, but he the Camelot, uh, the Caliber book I know from him is Camelot 3000. Even rougher than this stuff. <laughs> More Caliber? Man, Caliber published a lot and for a long time. Out of Detroit, I guess. Definitely out of Michigan. Go Man. I don't know Go Man. Neither do I, but this is like so steeped in that time period that it interests me in that way. The Michigan piece is fascinating to me because... This was the first issue I saw, like, in the box, and and uh, we claim uh, Don Simpson now, but he is from uh, Ann Arbor. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Matt Wagner cover on issue one. Yeah, this would be around. It would be in the later issues of uh, Caliber Presents. The Green Skull. Joe Zabel and Gary Dumb, co frequent collaborators with Harvey P. Carr. Um, whenever these guys collaborate together and put a comic out, it always looks kind of, like, uh, ge generic, but... It's always fun. It's always a good comic. There are so many of them that, like, I have no idea how yes. extensive. And I'll just grab whatever I find. Kind of interesting. I met these guys, one of those guys, and I'm not sure which. It's Space Early On, yeah, Ohio was, show. Yeah, it was Joe Zabel, and he pronounced uh, manga, manja. <laughs> he also did early, like, 3D modeling that that's would the be guy. in some of those comics. Yeah, that's the guy. Another caliber title and another western. Yeah, it's whatever. Westerns have that history in comics, too. You know, it's not just movies, but... I like the way this guy builds figures. Very bulky. Yeah, Tim Eld Eldred. I don't recognize that name, but... These comics can blend together. 
Grunts. Mirage. Mirage Studios. Some Turtles money printing this one. Eastman and, and Brian Talbot? No, no, no. Eric, Eric Talbot. Yeah, Eric yeah. Talbot. Yeah, look at that. Pretty wild. Great spread. So good. And I think this is an anthology. So, yeah, you see Peter Laird writing and drawing this one. So a few different stories in here. Mark Baudet. Gun Crisis, Iron Cat. Never heard of this. Yeah, me neither, but it looks pretty good. You know, it looks like they got a real uh, license. You know, it's like a company you never heard of, and they got a license to, like, print something. Yeah, I never know what you're looking at with this stuff. If it is something that's actually imprinted or uh, imported, or if it's something just American, highly yeah. inspired by them. You know, page layouts are kind of all over the map. Bulking up on my Dave Cooper collection. That's a lot of gun fury. This is an air cell comic. Dave Cooper, of course, uh, alternative comic. I don't know if darling's the right word, but I'm a big fan of his stuff. Got into painting. Yeah, you could see the painting starting to, to come into come into his gimmick you know, much later. This would be like the newest of, of the gun furies. But, you know, like very interesting, weird art. I'm a fan of the yeah, guy. Yeah, let's look at from that issue to this one. You can see like he's starting to get into weird lettering. One of his early gigs in like mainstream comics was he was a letterer at Dark Horse. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think these look amazing. Yeah, I do too. Colored by Leia Hernandez. Uh, and she's doing like her best like Steve Olive. That's Akira just beautiful, appro man. approximation, you know yeah. what I'm saying? This would, this would be that era. Um, I read this uh, a couple of days ago. Not a very good comic. Um, it's really fun to look at. Right. But there's the story is as confusing as you could imagine. Very, very good to look at, though. Yeah. And you don't see uh, a lot of manga from that era in color. This is a fun run of, of books. Speaking Eight of cents. stuff that doesn't look like anything else... This is John J. Muth and Kent Williams teaming up on Havoc and Wolverine. One, I guess, drew Wolverine and one drew the Havoc part. I didn't know that. I think that's how they divided their labor because stylistically they're very different. Yeah, that's what you want to see right there. That weird, like, Harlequin uh, jester cap. He would do, like, the red nose, you know, like the alcoholic nose. He did a... One of the first comics I ever bought was Wolverine 10, and Kent Williams did the Wolverine gallery on the back cover, and it was just a nightmarish version of Wolverine. I've never heard of this. Slave Labor. Got it for the obsessive cover. <laughs> and, and splash and, page. And interiors. Yeah, pretty cool looking. Not something I'm familiar with, but Slave Labor, probably on a smaller scale maybe than Caliber, but they published for a long time, maybe on a bigger scale than Caliber. They published from the, from the 80s till maybe still. They still have presence at San Diego Comic Con. We could say that. First publishers of, you know, my my first real published work, Street Angel, was at Slave Labor. Got to get the Ogden Whitney's whenever you see them. I'm sure I have at least a few of these things. John Byrne doing uh doing some Fat Fury here Weird. in color. This looks like that Next Men era. That was uh, when I was most in my John Byrne, when I was my biggest Byrne victim. Right. Was the Next Men. Yeah, Ogden Whitney's amazing and uh, kind of cool to see these in black and white reprints. Very crisp. This is another one of the monster imprints from Fanagraphics. Great cover. Really great cover. A little nonplussed with those interiors. Yeah, this is what I would call that competent. You know, it's almost too good to be really interesting and not quite idiosyncratic enough. Unlike yeah. Hero Project. <laughs> this is a weird one for you. This is from that... 80s black and white boom era, 1987, but you see it's in color, kind of unusual, but this is a really great panel. I wonder if that's a swipe, almost like a Toth Batman swipe or something. Fun comic, though, as you can see. That's going to be a run. Hero Sandwich. I know nothing about this one, Ed. Neither do I. I was first struck by how many there were. Yes. And uh, if you take a look, you know, it's not, it's not bad looking comics. Yeah, like that cover's very anime. Yeah, manga all through They like, like they don't know what they want to be. Like I think there's some anthropomorphic stuff going on. Um, a little fight in the background. Yeah, a lot of hair. That's man. pretty fun. My mom had that, that exact scene. haircut. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very King Louis-ish. Not quite a mullet. Some unusual stuff there. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this, but yeah, it must have been pretty good to run that long. 
You know, and, I, and when you hit the I don't quarter know if that bins, means it's good or not. <laughs> when you hit the quarter bins, I mean, this thing cost a dollar sixty. Yeah, that's the time to try out a new series. Heroes from Wordsmith. Good looking art. Don't know this comic at all. But that artist can certainly draw. Heroes of Rock and Fire. It's another one I'm, not, I'm completely unfamiliar with. 1987, black and white boom. Superhero. You wouldn't get much suit for all the all the stuff that came out in the black and white boom. There would actually be a small amount of superhero stuff in that mix. It's all other things. It's all anthropomorphic. It's all Dungeons and Dragons type shit. Yes. This one was just super weird, man. Like one of these like high school kids who is a fan of anime or some shit. 1993, Modesto, California. Snook. Wow. 1993, I mean, it's probably a huge image influence on this Challenge person. you to read it. Right. Stuff looks cool, though. Yeah. Wow. This looks like a character that would be in the wizard create a character totally. contest. Heroines, Inc. This is black and white boom era. Something you would expect. And a uh, pinup in the back here by Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, yeah. That's not him, but <laughs> Black Cobra. <laughs> These are funny. I know, like, like that's like sexy women. That's your Bill Sienkiewicz? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. That's Bill Sienkiewicz. Hero. This is part of the Anaya imprint that we've talked about. Kind of of the time period of like milestones beginning. That's a good one. Very nice art. One of those weird... You know, the, the, these are clearly self-published. Hey Gang Comics, one color printing on the cover, and then black and white interiors. Yeah, yeah, good looking stuff too. Like for, it, it's like better looking than you would think. Oh, it that's would be. cool. So a, a blue section inside reminds me of like the Big Bang comics a little bit. Mm -hmm. Highborn, nineteen ninety two. Never heard of this. I like how it looks. One trick that you can do for the black and white stuff is have lots of black on your pages. It really kind of pays off. Yeah, look at that, man. <laughs> that guy looks nuts. Radio Shack presents the history of electronics. 111 years on planet Earth. You find a, a, a few of these scattered around that'll be almost like industry-driven or company-driven. Almost advertising, propaganda, maybe something historical. Honor Among Thieves. You did well with picking up, like, runs of stuff. Yeah. One and two. Yeah, they would be together, together so, like, why not? Do you know this? This is a Michigan-based company, too. Yeah, I do not. Honor Among Thieves sounds like something I've heard of, but I've never read that. The Hoon. <laughs> yeah. Six. So much for my idea about the uh, higher numbers indicating anything. It looks so good, though, man. This does actually look pretty good. <laughs> that's that's I'm happy with that. Yeah, so what I'm saying is I'm gonna look for the other hoons. Like, look, this guy knows what he's doing, man. Yeah, that's kinda that's kinda wild. Great stylization. Look at the foreshortening like of that stamp. It's fun. And it has weight, it has good balance. Yeah, I was very dismissive of that cover and I don't know why. That cover looks even great even to me. Yeah, it doesn't look bad. I I might have another hoon. I'll have to dig around. Howard Stern versus Rush Limbaugh. This is another Boneyard Press. Yeah, just exploitation. Just like in the business of like trying to sell as many copies of a thing as possible. Not not great looking comics, but uh, Howard Stern. Yeah, this is... A, the Icon Devil's really good. This is Tim Tyler, I believe, right? I don't know that, but but uh, whoever it is, is fucking awesome. Yeah, this is tight. Yeah, maybe this isn't him. Wow, this is nice. I have, I think, one of these. We'll have the name of the guy in some of these things, man. It's a, it's a, unless he's Spider. Spider is Neil Hansen, right? I don't know. Untamed. Yeah, Neil Hansen. Yeah, he did that. Wow, that that looks neat. I don't know what that. Maybe that should be on a cover. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so ridiculous. 
Yeah, he did an epic heavy hitters called Untamed, Neil okay. Hansen, and other stuff. Like, I think he did some first comic stuff. Kyle Baker's I Die at Midnight, VTK. This was a Vertigo book around the year 2000, and it's early digital stuff. So, like, this is all being done, drawn, I think, with a stylus, colored, obviously, digitally. Kyle so, Baker, early mainstream guy to do that. So funny to think that he was even doing digital comics five years, ten years before this with Break the Chain. Yeah, and bizarre you know like like putting in billboards and things strange lettering styles yeah bleeding edge jonathan fox i've never heard of this before looks really nice, nice it's on this paper coated paper 1993 uh, this is out of illinois truck motorcycle trucks and motorcycles i'm already on on board i love how like sharp it is mm-hmm has a Galacy kind of vibe. Yeah. I like how this looks. Those yeah. figures look really nice. This is this is kind of interesting. I've never seen this before. Looks good. John Tarr is a uh, kind of an underground, legendary 80s black and white comic. Is that so? Really bizarre, weird. And John Tarr, by the way, is an elf. So it fits in with that elf, uh, elf concept. But pretty weird you know like, like as these things go this is this is a the next level of weirdness this is a nice stack of comics yeah yeah the three three mi different miniseries i thought that there was uh just legend of mother sarah that was it one and done yeah but there's two other miniseries and they they were all uh they were all in the quarter bins that's a heck of a fine so this is a follow-up of otomo to after akira he's just writing it but you can see the artist is a pretty uh pretty tight you know, I'm, I'm sure it's somebody he picked. Yeah. It's nice to get all of these. I picked up the first run, and they're okay, but there's not a lot of... You know, it's kind of a pretty pretty thin story. So I assume over the course of these several volumes, you get a, a much more satisfying story. Really awesome. Yeah. City of Children and uh, City of the Angels, if for those playing at home. I ended up grabbing this issue of Malibu Sun. Uh, that was promoting the Inevitable Youngblood series because there were some uh, Rob Liefeld sketches I've never seen for his various characters. Yeah, I love these kinds of things, and especially if they have some significant issue. The March Hare, this is a noteworthy because of Keith Giffen. Yeah. Good Keith Giffen, you know, well, uh, you know, he is Keith Giffen at this point, but it's black and white. I think this was supposed to be four issues, and I don't know whether other issues were published or uh, not. Interesting. Because I, I, I have seen this. I kept my eyes peeled. Yeah. It's very attractive. I got I got this in my last quarter bin find, and the meticulous nature of this Whoa. artwork is what really like uh, sealed the deal for me. So it was awesome finding an issue three. That is really strong stuff. Of this Man, thing. look at the great lettering. It reminds me of uh, Pinball Machine Back Glass yes. artwork. You know, very 70s. The stipple technique is just ridiculous to employ on comic pages. I can't believe when people do that. Yeah. What uh, What's that? Mech it, things. Yeah, Renegade. Okay. That cover is pretty disappointing compared to the inside. Yeah. Melting Pot. This is Kevin Eastman, Eric Talbot, and Simon Bisley. Talbot is awesome. I wonder what he's up to. Like, I've just been reading a lot of um, Turtles comics lately, and my favorites always seem to land on something that Eric Talbot has something to do with. Yeah, his turtle stuff looks really strong. This is a pretty interesting mix-up because Bisley is just painting the, the colors on this, I think. And uh, it's kind of a unusual collaboration. I think there are four of these out, out in the wild as well. Yeah. This is Bern Hogarth. Tarzan illustrator for the daily for the uh, weekly comic strip after Hal Foster, renowned for his figure work. Yeah, well, he invents muscles, <laughs> and, and uh, through his invention, he was able to build a whole secondary career uh, with those damn books. But never seen this artwork, never no. seen this stuff. There, there would be a market for this. Like mm -hmm. there would be people that would be super into this. It'd be like the First Kingdom people. Like the people who would read First Kingdom would read something yeah. like this, and and it comes from their love of Hal Foster. Yeah, this one was a big surprise, man. The Natural Selection Killer Asteroid. That's a great-looking cover. Very sp odd. Spelled incorrectly. <laughs> but uh, it's Carl Stevens, man. He said he was 19 years old when he did this. He just uh, put a comment on your Instagram today, and I said, no, dude, we're going to be looking through one of your early comics from 1998. He's like, be gentle. I was only 19 <laughs> years old. 
Well, this looks pretty damn sharp. Yeah. Wow. Let me tell you what I was not doing at 19. I know. And you could see the Stevens in there, you know? Like, yes. Like, remarkable crosshatcher. Yeah, this is this is pretty strong. I wonder how much... If he's 19, he couldn't have been doing much before this. I'm sure this is numero uno when it came to, like... Well, I'm not sure, but you know what I'm saying. Well, it's issue three, so... Oh, is it for real? Issue three. Holy fuck. Unless he's pulling our leg. <laughs> yeah. The New Life Brigade, published by Blue Comet Comics... Life Brigade was one of the first black and white comics I picked up that really sold me on the 80s black and white explosion. And it's by uh, C.A. Storman, Craig Storman. Um, at this point, he's teaming up. He's being inked by somebody else. But it's still like this intergalactic team. And Chris Pitzer, Ad House Books publisher, friend of the show, picked up a bunch of the Stro Storman art for various reasons. But, you know, you can see this is kind of a mashup of different sci-fi sci and superhero stylings. I think he's a real interesting artist. I don't know how much other stuff he did, but the initial Life Brigade comics must have been good enough that he published into the 90s, so from like 86 to the early 90s. Published quite a few books and uh, pretty pretty uh, unusual stuff. Nightmasters is another one of those 80s black and white comics that I found early on and enjoyed, and they look totally amateur, and it's part of their charm. I think it's done by a husband and wife team and from somewhere like Central... You know, like the Midwest, Topeka. In, in this last quarter bin haul, I've seen a lot of uh, men and women who have the, who share the same last name doing uh, working on comics together, man. So that was a part of uh, the whole trip during that black and white boom. Probably have to convince your wife to, to like, use some of the savings account to <laughs> publish your books. Night Vision. Autographed. This yeah. is a David Quinn written series. Yeah, with Hannibal King on art. Is it a Rebel? I think it is. Yeah, Rebel Studios. I grabbed a couple interesting Rebel books that were not uh, Tim Vigil. Uh, basically, anything I saw down there, I scooped up. Yeah, and so this is a subsequent volume. Now the artist is Kyle Hott, still David Quinn, published by London Knight. Interesting. Omen number one, first sensational issue. We learned this is Tim, Tim Vigil's follow-up to Grips. So this would have been the next big project uh, early in his career. He said it didn't sell as well. It's more science fiction rather than like the dark vigilante. Yeah, and then they encourage him to get back to the gore stuff. That's pretty pretty amazing. I mean, you can see it's Tim Vigil. If you're a Vigil fan, like, it's here. He was really uh, doing it. These metallic textures, too, are really strong. Quest presents Lance Court. Kerrigan of the Galactic Legion. Number three, signed Jason. This is Jay Dis Dispro? Yep. Jay Dispro. This guy's career goes back to the, like the 50s, maybe even the 40s. Uh, way, way earlier. And he was doing like pre-code horror comics and things of that sort. Super tight stuff. I looked him up at some point because I picked up a couple of comics of this sort and was like, who is this guy? Because, I mean, clearly highly rendered stuff. He did a webcomic, you know, in the 2000s that ran... I think maybe hundreds of pages. Must have had a grandson who knew the, who knew HTML or some such. Pretty wild, though. You know, it's a long, long career. I don't know what he did between the 50s and, and you know, the 80s. The, the Robert Crumb is the guy who kind of brought this guy out of the depths in the same way that Paul Karasik would have brought uh, Fletcher Hanks out. But, yeah, Crumb's a big fan. And you could see it in his Philip Dick K. Dick uh, strips. Tim Tyler, double feature. I never knew Ratsbane existed, don't know anything about it. Because it's impossible to even read that title. It is, that's a bad title. But but uh, this is in every quarter bin, and I pick it up every time. Yes, yeah. This is, uh, yeah, definitely this is one you can find. 1992, I mentioned how he has like a little bit of that image style in there. You can really see it in this book. Like yeah. just super rendered, cross-hatched muscles. I bet we could talk to him about uh, Platt. yeah. I, I dig his stuff. He, he's been a relatively recent discovery, at least as a collector for me. And like you say, Ed, you can almost always find some new Tyler whenever you're looking through these bins. Does not disappoint. 
couple of issues of Sea Dragon. I bought it for the attractive covers. Like I thought, saw this and thought it was pretty freaking cool. Uh, Elite Comics Epsilon Wave is the is the series that you could see in most of the quarter bins, and uh, I had no idea that Elite Studios publish other books. Yeah, 1986, Doing Color, out of Texas. They published a, a handful of comics. Like this is number eight, or I think. Or... Epsilon Wave would go real deep. It's two issue two and four. Oh, oh, okay. Epsilon Wave six is referenced there, so that's what made me think these were further along. But that's quite a feat. This is a comic that I've picked up a couple issues of. There's like Shaolin Tiger and stuff. Martial arts comics. Weird image, kind of self-published sensibilities. Unusual color ninjas. Of course, I'm gonna pick those up. Want to see what my? Uh, we'll skip ahead. Because uh, in the interest of time, a couple things, man. I made some discoveries in the history of comics. No idea that the spirit had a daily strip. Never saw this before in my life. Yeah. And each of these volumes, I got two and three, contain 200 dailies. Wow. So that's something. I'm a, I'm a fan of Will Eisner's spirit those comics. Are, what are those? Who even publishes those? Yeah, it's a weird, like almost like a fan thing. And there's no discernible... Uh, Interesting. Indicia or anything. That's a cool pickup for twenty cents. Yeah. Um, let's let's go to the heavy hitter, Ben. The one that you won't be able to believe. Are you ready? Twenty cents a piece, man. Well, that takes the cake. This is your winning uh, find. Unbelievable original THBs for twenty cents. Twenty cents. What a, a treasure! Piece. Do you uh, know? Did you look these up? Like what they're worth? I did, and they'll they'll go for twenty bucks a piece. Oh, that's not terrible. People that are interested. These are good comics. These are really good comics. These are self-published Paul Pope comics from the 90s. Oh, and, and, and here's, how, here's how we can prove that it's a uh, rescue mission. I already got them shits, man. <laughs> that's that's. But you impressive. know what? I, I actually did not have issue five. Uh, I didn't have issue five, so, so that's super cool. One thing that's really neat about these is how well designed they are from the mm -hmm. get-go. You know, Paul Pope obviously celebrated, but self-publishing is a big step for a young guy look good from the get-go he had that hugely few influential very film. distinct things like like featuring photos of himself you know like cult of personality but the artwork man the artwork in these pulling from european tradition just didn't see stuff like this not at all that looks then, like some akira reference there and then afterward you saw a lot of people kind of cribbing that style and being a little Huge bit more influence. a little more confident with that thick uh ink ink line inking with a brush man he, he kind of really brought that back for a generation early brandon graham's Radio Comics, Universe So Big. I, I, have, I don't know these. Yeah, I have one or two of these. So if I could dig those out again, man, I'll, I'll pass the stuff on to you. But this is this may or may not be before his uh, like NBM porno comics, Pillow Talking. What's the date on those? Um, 2000. Wow. Yeah, that's early. That's before I met him. Yeah, I think maybe Pillow Talk was in the 90s, but I'm, I'm not too sure. It's pretty fun to see these two because you can see it's Brandon Graham. Absolutely. I mean, he's he is who he was, man. Like, like he's... he's he ain't playing around. That's some innovative shit for 2000. Nice Dan Klaus cover. Yes. Here's the other one I bought for the title alone, Vampiric Jihad. It actually looks kind of good, too. <laughs> Here's one, uh, uh, Dean Haspel, The Verdict. And I knew him to be an assistant to Howard Shakey and to Walt Simonson. This bridges the gap because you see no discernible evidence of that in his current comics. But uh, you see the Shakey influence in this old thing, and I was very happy to That thing's to pretty tight. This. Yeah, we'll close out with these, man, for 20 cents. Uh, I never read Yummy Fur when I was a kid, when I discovered it through Palmer's Picks, through people recommending it through Wizard Magazine. The speculator prices were already happening, and this was an expensive comic. So to find these for, you know, a couple of dimes a piece, man, forget about it. These are amazing comics. Yummy Fur, to me, is one of the, the greatest comic book series ever published. These... Early issues, like this is issue one, it's reprinting mini-comics that he made. Uh -huh. So you can see like kind of weird formatting choices and stuff. Yeah, we talk about it in other videos. We, we might uh, even, even link them in. But uh, there are even more comics in this thing. We're coming up on 33 minutes. We talked about this box for about an hour and a half. Once again, 388 comics for $75, man. Comes out to 20 cents a piece, man. It's a good haul. It's a damn good haul. Let's get the hell out of here, man, and go back to making our own comics, man. Like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. We'll notify you whenever we have fresh videos available. You can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch at our spread shop. Link below the video. You guys know what your marching orders are. 
read more comics. <laughs>